restoration farming. On this, Farm to Fork, Wyoming. This is our CSA, it's Community Supported Agriculture. It's where we have about uh, 40 members of the community that come in to help support the farm. They pre-purchase all their vegetables. It was an old dairy. This was gravel and that was all heavy clay. Alkali down below. Scott Richard, like most other specialty crop producers in Wyoming, is an innovator. Well, I'm certainly doing something a little different than what my neighbors are. It's still a question, I think, it's still a question as to whether or not I'm actually going to be successful at this, but we'll see. Uh, three of these and one of these. With 20 plus years of experience growing organically, he does have an advantage. Got it? That is the big one. Okay, let's go ahead and put that forward. Scott fell in love with growing in the second grade, living out in California. Once I hit 14, I was in, in Denver, out, outside of Denver, Morrison, Colorado. So I got to, I went from, from real easy growing, just kind of throwing seeds in the soil and things just growing to it being all of a sudden really difficult to, to grow. Uh, the Rocky Mountains are a completely different way of, you know, you have to approach things completely different. The soil is different. Um, I take it back down to the microbes. I think that the microbes aren't, there isn't as, as much diversity in the soil as there is in California. Trying to understand the soil of the Rockies led him to use biological methods. Once I went to biodynamic farming, my garden completely changed. Um, I went from tomato plants that were, you know, struggled and you might get a, you know, a handful of tomatoes off of them to tomatoes that were, you know, eight, ten feet tall, heavily, heavy, heavy production. Um, not that I still didn't have, you know, years that, you know, it just wasn't warm. I still had trouble with that. But, you know, lettuces and such went from, you know, struggling, strong flavored lettuces to, you know, nice sized remains that um, had very mild, very pleasant flavors. But what is biodynamic farming? It's a term you hear tossed around these days as more organic farmers are employing some of the methods. In its truest form, biodynamic farming originated with Austrian scientist and philosopher Rudolf Steiner in the 1920s. Steiner was approached by a group of European farmers concerned by the declining vitality of their food crops and farm animals. As the Industrial Revolution transformed Europe's agrarian landscapes, they saw problems with long-term fertility, seed quality, and disease resistance. Before the revolution, farms were typically small, with a high diversity of animals and food crops. In response, Steiner laid down the principles of a self-regenerative farm system he called the Spiritual Foundations for the Renewal of Agriculture. He suggested that farms should be thought of as living organisms rather than factories. Today, Steiner's biodynamic farming is practiced around the world on large and small scale operations that ultimately reintegrate animals, plants, insects, and as much biodiversity as possible into a revolving farm cycle. In the United States, we're starting to see more biodynamic products make their way into the mainstream marketplace. As more farmers embrace biodynamics, and we understand more about microbiology, some of the esoteric practices are starting to appear less mystical. The standard that certifies biodynamic farms today is known as the Demeter Standard, which was established in Europe in 1928. It's recognized for exceeding the certified organic standard and is showing up on labels in the US. But back to Scott's farm. While he doesn't practice biodynamics in its purest form, many of his methods parallel the philosophy towards on-farm perpetuated vitality. My efforts in 
my controls are in the soil, is developing the microbes in the soil, uh, putting food in the soil that uh, the microbes can eat um, and live and, and have a rich diversity in. Um, trying to keep those microbes alive over the winter as opposed to letting them all die back and then trying to take six weeks or, or longer for them to, to reestablish this, themselves. So this is something you mix together to compost? We did layer. use the skid steer, mix it together. It's got wood chip, uh, leaves, uh, spoiled straw, hay, and um, lots of oat holes this year. Uh-huh. So when do you think this stuff's going to be ready to start using? Well, we're hoping that uh, we'll turn it one more time this uh, spring and probably in the next few weeks and then we'll start using it um, probably come first of April. The goal is to replenish the organic matter and organisms in the soil to eventually eliminate nearly all mined and imported soil amendments. So the summer is the time that I can do a lot of composting so I'll do a, actually in place so I'll do a lot of mulching. And this is uh, one of our high tunnels, and it was just, uh, we just, we planted it about a month ago, we just started putting the compost and uh, such in here. It's uh, several layers, it's a layer of straw, a layer of oat hulls, and then we put the compost on top of that. And what we're trying to do is just create a, almost a compost pile in place that allows the microbes and worms and such to have a place for, to, to eat and have lots of food. So as they're happy and they're content and they're growing and such, it's releasing chemicals, their waste products are all being released and, and feeding the plants. So the plants are kind of mm, sort of secondary to the, what I'm trying to do, which is of course trying to generate a lot of life in the soil. And they just kind of push their way up through this sort of compost that I'm creating right next to them. But this is, this is some of that composting area that we were talking about, you know, about getting the microbial life. Right. Digging down in. Let's see if I can see them. Oh, You're starting to see a few of them. They're not, they were showing up really well yesterday. Here we go. So you can see all the worms. They're just, you can see them all wigging around down in here. And so they go through here and they start breaking everything down. And their waste then feeds the, the, uh, um, the, oh. So that was just, just holes a, and now it's like turning into dirt. Into, into compost, yeah. These guys are all eating it up and um, it's almost a sense of, of worm culture. Mm-hmm. So even the fertilizers, so the fertilizers that I use, that even the organic varieties, it's, they're pretty strong, you know, for, um, for life in general. And by putting them in, in a place to where they can be absorbed by the the straws and such things. It helps distribute them more evenly and gives a chance to go through several senses of uh, generations of life. You know, mm -hmm. maybe some, some bugs and worms and other things before it actually hits the plant. Mm -hmm. So it has a chance of, everything has a chance of, you know, being buffered some. By avoiding herbicides and pesticides, greater biological diversity is sustained. You know, the, the way we're growing conventionally is is not producing the most nutritional food out there. Um, this biodynamic method creates such a diversity of, of nutrients in the soil, even the plants, you can taste it. You can taste the, the, the difference between a hydroponic tomato and a tomato that's grown biodynamically. It's, it smells like a tomato, it tastes like a tomato. The lettuce taste it has more flavor. Um, there's more structure to the, to the spinach and everything lasts longer because it's healthier. Many of us assume that in addition to the absence of synthetic chemicals, organically grown food is nutritionally superior. But I had recently learned that this was not always the case. It can be certified organic, but not have the nutrient yield that's any better than a conventional. Which I, I think it's just all about chemicals. So yeah. if, if even they're, they're organic, I mean, it's still a chemical. I mean, it's still, it's been processed down into, you know, a place right here. and. You know, you can spread it on your, your, your field just like you do regular conventional stuff. Mm -hmm. and if, and if, you're, if your soil is dead and all it is is just a, a you know, a, 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 a space where you're growing in, then, you know, whether you're using organic or conventional chemicals, it's just like, it's just the same thing. It's just you're growing with chemicals. Right. 
and that's where I think that the, the trouble is, is that, you know, if you want good nutrient, nutrient dense foods and you have to have um, soil that is highly nutrient dense. Uh, it's getting healthy food to kids and we have classically in the last 20 years moved completely away from that. No That's kidding. More and more farmers are understanding the important role of these microbes and the implications of our over-reliance on synthetic and mined inputs. All of these inputs that we've had available to us through this whole you know, century or more of industrialized agriculture, we are now using up. Our fossil fuels are now depleted to a point where the costs are dramatically going up. Rock phosphate and uh, potash reserves are being depleted. We're drawing down our fresh water resources. So these are all vital inputs that have sustained this uh, agriculture of you know, where we dominate nature and force nature to do what we want it to do. So as the costs continue to go up on these basic resources we've been using, uh, they'll eventually become uh, un un unaffordable and, uh, and eventually we run out of them. So uh, we, one of the things I think that we need to do now is to begin to figure out systems that are much more self-renewing and self-regulating that use nature's own powers of restoration uh, and critical for that is restoring the biological health of our soil because when you have biologically healthy soil, the soil is much more productive. It doesn't need all the inputs. Uh, it absorbs more water and stores more water in the soil so that you don't have as much flooding and in, during drought periods you have more moisture in the soil to sustain uh, the food that you need to produce. Uh, so these are all kinds of transitions that we have to make. And, and again, a part of the good news is that we have examples of uh, farmers and others who are already beginning to do this. Another one of Scott's biological applications is compost tea. The general idea of compost tea is it has upwards of 160 different bacterial spores or, or life of some sort. It also has um, the inoculants for funguses and viruses and such. And then I'll let it brew for upwards of 24 hours, somewhere in there. A lot of air, tremendous amounts of air, lots of movement of the water. They have a chance just to go through a huge living process and you know the death of those animals and their biological wastes are just as important as the, the bacteria itself. So compost tea is a foliar spray is a and pesticide. Sort of, it, yes. Kind yes. of. It doesn't really kill, it doesn't kill anybody, it just makes it so the plant is less desirable to eat and uh -huh. consume. So, oh, interesting. Um, it, the bacteria and such can be pretty hard, and the viruses and such that are in there can also be pretty hard on some of the soft-shelled things like uh, aphids and things. I just started learning about it in the last four years or mm -hmm. thereabouts, and I suspect it hasn't been in mainstream at all, if it is there yet, but um, you know, there, I think there's just researchers beginning to you know, be done on it and just do exactly all that does happen, but I've been very impressed. And the world of soil fungus is becoming better understood also. This one is uh, mycorrhizae. So this is a, a fungus that actually uh, is fed by the plant. It mm. actually hooks onto the, the root of the plant and the plant feeds it sugars in, in exchange fungus is breaking down the soil that's around it, or not soil, breaking down the, the nutrients around it and feeding the plant. Put a little few of these grains into the, uh -huh. uh, into the tomatoes um, and when I transplant them. And then once transplanted uh, into the soil, it doesn't take much. It'll still be inoculated and the way they'll go. As Scott rebuilds the farm's fertility after years as a dairy operation, he's brought in local plant matter for composting. What have you come up with for um, inputs? I've been real excited about the oat holes this year. Uh, we just got them this year, probably. We did bring in about 10 truckloads, uh, semi-truckloads, which was great. Um, we're real excited about that. We use straw, hay, Predominantly, it's straw. It's the cheapest available source of organic materials that I can I can get access to. Uh, hay I can get access to when it's been spoiled, 
and people don't want it anymore. I think hands down leaves are the, the best product that you can access to. There's so much complicated or more diverse uh, nutrients inside of a leaf than there is inside of straw. I mean, you can just sort of see the straw is just, it's, it's pretty much just one, one or two things, you know, there's a little bit of cellulose in there and, and very little else in here. Um, and it's all pretty much the same. Whereas you get the leaves, you get leaves from cottonwood trees or from, you know, from all the different variety of trees that are associated with, you know, with somebody's backyard that you get a lot more diversity of, and complexity of, of cellulose and, and nutrients and metals and all sorts of things that are in the in the, the leaf itself. But Scott has had to navigate some hazards in his search for local organic matter. What you got contaminated with was milestone. Is that that right? was the that's the brand name. It's like Crest or, or Tide, but it's amino pyrrolid is the the general uh, generic variety. Um, it's a long lasting, resilient herbicide that is active below detection levels. It will make your garden not grow for several years. Um, lots of people around the space have had some issues with that, with gardens that just aren't, that just aren't producing. It's like why, you know, they were doing just great and now all of a sudden they're not producing anymore. So uh, what evidence do you see of its effects? So tomato plants, the, the growing stem um, starts coming out and it starts becoming more and more closed to where it, it can't even unfurl a leaf and this looks like the end, like my fist. Uh, plants that come up and just die. Um, you know, I had lots of trouble with uh, spinach and lettuces that would come up and just not thrive. Instead of having a rich, you know, rich, beautiful looking lettuces, they're, they're really small and, and clearly struggling not having the ability to be able to, uh, to grow. Since about 2006, this class of chemicals has been used in hay and barley and other grass-type crops to deal with some particularly invasive weeds. It, it hit the compost industry really hard, and they, the commercial compost industry very hard several years ago when this first happened, and it caught them by surprise because up until that point, all herbicides had been breaking down and compost really well. Caitlin came to Wyoming from Washington State, where ag extension agents did a lot of educating on how to isolate this problem. Composting does a great job of breaking down many of what we would call or, or inorganic contaminants. So that could be herbicides or pesticides, it could be uh, wormers or pharmaceuticals, could be um, cleaning products, anything that goes down the drain. There are, there are a number of things that composting does a great job of breaking down. One exception is the aminopyrrolid and clopyrrolid class of herbicides, one of which is milestone product. It's a broadleaf herbicide that's highly effective at very low concentrations. And where it's become an issue in compost is through grass clippings and also through livestock manure. So it's used on hay fields as a broadleaf herbicide. The, it, the livestock consume the hay that contain, that has been sprayed with some of this herbicide. They eat the hay, it passes through their digestive system into the manure. The manure is then composted. It doesn't break down in a typical compost cycle like all other herbicides have been shown to do. And then when that compost is applied to a garden or to a farm, it can damage or kill some of the broadleaf plants that are being grown there. According to Dow AgroSciences, aminopyrrolid is non-cancer causing and is virtually non-toxic when consumed. But for Scott's farm, it's taken four years to overcome the effects. So we just picked this down to the bone maybe two weeks ago, and look how much it's come back. This last season, what I saw was phenomenal productivity. So yeah, we're starting starting to get into it. So crop failures are going to continue to reduce. Mm. We're moving further mm -hmm. and further away from the milestone. Uh, we're getting the, the larger amounts of organic materials, and we're going to start, we're gonna start getting into that balanced soil, nutrients, mm. and uh, uh, chemistry. Uh, when you're just putting huge amounts of organic material in, you're going to throw off the balance for mm. a short term until things, things, the life catches up. Despite the challenges, Scott sees increasing demand and opportunity in the market. I think that people are realizing that the food that they're eating is um, highly questionable in terms of nutrition. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've spent a generation or two of working at trying to make it so it's easier to, to to grow, to, to process, you know, to, uh, to harvest, um, instead of dealing with nutrition, 
you know, in good taste. Yeah. We've been concentrating on other things. And so that's what we have. We have food that's not as nutritional. Uh, I, I see lots of folks that are chefs that are coming in that are really interested in, in cooking with local food because they appreciate the, the increased value from the, the flavors and the nutrition and um, the joy that others have mm -hmm. um, by eating their food. I still think that uh, this is uh, still essentially a market that's waiting to happen. I mean, it's, it's been evolving. And then the other thing that's, what, that, that's very interesting and that's, that's kind of good news is that the most successful farmers of the middle are those that have aggregated uh, to uh, work together and form their, whether it's a farmer-owned co-op or a LLC or some other kind of business structure where they differentiate their product but pool their product and market it together with their own brand. So you have uh, groups like uh, Organic Valley, uh, Diamond Ranch, uh, Shepherd's Grain, you know, there are a number of them out there, uh, Red Tomato, uh, who have done this. And, uh, and they're actually quite successful uh, for the most part. And one of their successes is that the average age of their farmers is actually going down instead of up like, you know, the general age of farmers in the United States. So uh, there's, a, there's an opportunity uh, to do more of that. We call them values-based value chains. Values-based values -based value chains, yeah. yeah. They're based on values that they market, yeah. I found one of Scott's customers, the Willow Fence Tea Room, tucked away off the beaten path in a Cody neighborhood. So what is a tea room? Well, in my opinion, <clears throat> a tea room is whatever the owner says it is. Because all the, I researched for four or five years before I did it. They're all shapes and sizes, they're all different kinds of offerings, they're all different hours and days, they're all different kinds of fare. Some people just deal with black tea, some people have world tea, some people have... It's just whatever you come up with. Open only for lunch, two hours a day. I managed to get in for the soup and salad with a grilled cheese sandwich. We use with her homemade bread, she makes that daily grills it on both sides, so you're crunchy inside as well as outside. Two different cheeses. Your salad, of course, all the greens come out of Shoshone River Farms, so it's all fresh in the morning, very nice and crispy. And as well as the soup vegetables are all from Shoshone River Farms also. Chicken herb and roasted on the, in the oven, so it's never breaded, just a nice slight herby. And that's it, so it's very good. Butter for your bread, enjoy. I just did it for local people so they have a nice place to bring their girlfriend or husband or sweetheart to lunch. That's all, that's all it was about, just a nice place for special events and some just plain home cooking. I can't believe no one had pot roast today. And I was raised on a farm. It was like, no running water, no electricity. We, ro we raised all of our own food, our, from the meat to the vegetables to the corn and potatoes and grain, everything. We, had, we usually had 100 hogs, 25 milk cows, about 100, 150 head of cattle, 800 acres of grains and corn. and and uh, no irrigation. So we were at the mercy of the weather, you know. So I have an enormous reverence for how it gets from the field to here. Shoney Farms is probably my main produce supplier, I have to say. I get a few here and other places, but mm -hmm. not very often. I design my menu around what he has to offer. It isn't like, hey, do you have any of this? It's like, what do you have today? And I'll take whatever this list is. It's just like I was raised, really. It's mm -hmm. the way I was raised. You go out to the garden with your baskets and pick what you need for the day. You know, he got me on eggplant. I always thought eggplant was, like, really lost on me. I never really got it. And so he, he just kept bringing it and kept bringing it. I went, all right, all right. And now it's like I can't wait to get it. But I, I never, I thought, oh, eggplant. And I like everything, really, but it's like, eggplant, really? But then I started working with it, and people love it, but he had to kind of force that one on me. So do you think your customers know no. what you're doing? A few do. There's a few do. Uh, you know, regulars that... Some will, I've, I've heard people sit there and say, you know what, I can feel the nutrition going into my cells right now, but this is so fresh. And I said, well, that was just picked this morning. That's why you can taste that. Hmm. Some of them get... Some of them really do get it and really appreciate it. Some of them come here almost every day. I said... You know, that's a lot of pressure, because then I have to have a new menu every day for you people. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. They said, it's okay. We'll eat your leftovers. It's fine. <laughs> so, we'll eat your leftovers. Some people do get it. And that, that's probably the best reward of all, that they really get what's going on.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And sometimes I can't plan my menu till I get up in the morning. And people will call, what are you cooking on Tuesday? I said, I don't even know what I'm cooking today. You're just going to have to come and eat. <laughs> just come and eat. It'll be all right. I promise you. I can't tell you. I can't believe you do all your own baking. Sister, you're up. Sometimes I'm even grinding the wheat to make the flour to make the bread. You know, it's, it's like, there's a lot of steps. Yeah. So if you can keep everything fresh and keep it something you didn't have yesterday, <laughs> you're in. <laughs> in spite of not advertising, the tea room has become a destination. All the tea rooms I've ever been to, they're all off the beaten path. It's just part of their, in fact, they're a destination point for a lot of people. It's like if they know there's one there, they'll go and they'll seek it out. And, and if you're not open, they'll wait till you are. And maybe there's a bigger reason to support these small, local producers. You know, Cody isn't on the way to anywhere as far as supplies go. So the fact that we have great produce here at all is a miracle. Not, I shouldn't say great, but it's pretty, what, what I get locally is great. But if that food source dried up, like the highway from Denver or down from Billings, Elmer's and Kmart's grocery store would be empty in three days. Mm -hmm. And people would be wishing they had a hook house and a yeah. garden and a freezer and a cache and a pantry and a root cellar, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, a couple sheep in the background.